So hello, everyone. If you would uh, take your seats, I think we're going to get started. Um, there will probably be a few people milling in because we do have another uh, event that is just ending just before this one, and it's in the J building. So, um, but we, we don't want to slip too much. Um, so have a seat. Uh, there's coffee in the other room. So, um, so this morning we are broadcasting this event live on World Bank Live. Um, if you're participating in social media, we are using the hashtag United Against Corruption. Um, let me ask uh, our Vice President for Equitable Growth and Finance, uh, Equitable Growth Finance and Institutions, Jayla Pajabashiolu, to offer some <laughs> opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was, uh, must be the tough part of, uh, <laughs> of the introduction, but you did a great job. So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on Global Anti-Corruption Day, and a very special welcome to our distinguished panelists. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, I know some colleagues will come, and a lot of uh, them are online. And um, really, um, for us, today is the anniversary of the passage of the United Nations Convention uh, Against Corruption on December 9, 2003. And according to the UN, every year, $1 trillion is paid on bribes, $1 trillion. And an estimated $2.6 trillion are stolen annually through corruption. And that's more than 5% of global GDP. So the numbers we are talking about are very substantial. 10 times official development assistance. And for us, this is critical because we are an institution that works on development, on ending extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity. And seeing this type of um, uh, corruption-related uh, distortions really makes, us, uh, makes it very difficult for us to achieve our mandate. At the 1996 annual meetings, we had one of the most famous speeches by a bank president using words never spoken by a previous president, Jim Wolfenson told the delegates, we must tackle the issue of economic and financial efficiency, but we also need to address transparency, accountability, and institutional capacity. And let's not mince words. We need to deal with the cancer of corruption. And today, we and many others around the world are calling for action to end corruption to mitigate the risks from corruption. Together with our colleagues in Integrity Vice Presidency, we planned the full agenda. Uh, some of them are still there and, and hopefully making their way to here. Earlier this morning, they had an excellent discussion on technology and fraud detection and how to harness data to combat corruption. And today, this second panel discussion will focus on the actions needed to improve the transparency of beneficial ownership information to reduce the abuse of anonymous company structures to divert public funds for private gain. The Panama and Paradise Papers revealed to the public the massive scale on which anonymously owned companies are abused for illicit ends. The panel of experts today will help us shine a spotlight on this practice and its impact on development and what we can do about it. Before the panel, I'd like to take a few minutes to share some thoughts of our view of um, corruption at the World Bank Group, how it affects our work, what are we doing to address it, and our plans going forward. So first on corruption. It's a major optical, as I said before, to achieve our goals of poverty reduction and inclusive growth. It threatens our ability to mobilize private finance because it really hurts investor confidence and reduces incentives for private sector expansion. It weakens our ability to achieve the full potential for human capital. This is a clear priority for the World Bank Group, and it's a really a main a vital enabler of uh, stability as well as prosperity because it has implications on growth by reducing citizens' access to needed health and education services. Corruption is a threat to our major commitment, again, in terms of jobs, gender, and climate change agendas. When businesses and individuals see public accounts looted and abused, they, they are much less motivated to pay taxes and other levies. So no economy is immune from the damaging effects of corruption, but the world's poorest and most vulnerable suffer the most because it impacts them the most. So it's very simple. We will not be able to achieve our goals of extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity without addressing corruption. 
Second, corruption weakens trust in institutions, which can lead to conflict and violence, because it interferes with citizens' ability to obtain basic services, such as license, access to electricity, or a permit to sustain their means of livelihood. And we have seen many times, especially recently, how that frustration can then boil into protests or violence, as we have uh, been uh, seeing in many of the fragile com countries as well. So what are we doing? What have we done so far to address corruption? We have been working as the World Bank Group on corruption for over 20 years, supporting interventions at promoting the rule of law, which is critical to this effort, transparency, efficient public service delivery, and addressing major distortions of markets and finance. All are very important for successful development outcomes. We have contributed to the creation and adoption of policies and tools and to strengthen institutions that, cor that confront corruption across the globe. We have supported governments and the financial sector in combating money laundering. We have strengthened our approach to managing corruption risks in the activities we finance and to changing behavior of firms through the bank sanction system and compliance program, which our integrity vice presidency works on. We support anti-corruption efforts at the global level, providing technical support to international policy-making bodies. I'm just coming back uh, from the G20 meetings in Riyadh this past weekend, and this was one of the key issues, because their key priority is access to opportunity. And access to opportunity is not going to happen if we have um, this much uh, problems with corruption and transparency. We have been supporting fiscal transparency in resource-rich states through the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. We support the adoption of accountability measures through the Open Government Partnership and through the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative Partnership between the World Bank Group and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. We work to create a world in which stealing from the poor uh, is condoned and embezzled public funds are returned and victims are c of corruption are compensated. So these efforts have contributed to many positive results, such as improving the efficiency and integrity of public financial management systems, the adoption of electronic procurement systems that contribute to greater accountability and transparency, open access to budget information and other public accountability mechanisms like income and asset declarations and conflict of interest regulations. So we have achieved much in reducing corruption, especially administrative corruption, but still we have a long way to go. Corruption still remains a, a major development challenge. So what are we gonna do going forward? As I mentioned, we have bigger challenges. So these are state capture, self-dealing by political elites, and illicit financial flows, which really weaken economic outcome, outcomes and spur inequality. These challenges call on us to think in new ways. We have to be much more creative and have new tools and harness new opportunities such as those offered by data and technology revolution. So we need to uh, think about how to use big data, artificial intelligence to better ensure efficiency, integrity, and value for money in procurement, financial management, and service delivery. We are increasing our focus on data literacy to make sure that the government and civil society across can use data to, to take action. We're supporting the info implementation of GovTech which is um, a very big initiative for us, as well as FinTech and other initiatives across the bank group to have the potential to reduce or eliminate opportunities to seek and receive bribes in government operations and public service delivery. We're not naive. We also know that these technological developments come with risks, cyber risk, consumer protection, and so on and so forth. And these are part of our work, both on opportunities as well as uh, mitigating the risks. We have been working hard on gaining insights from behavioral science to refresh our approach to the drivers of corruption in a changing, rapidly changing world. We have been working on high risk but very important sectors such as infrastructure, extractives, health and education, all of which are critical to job creation and human capital development. To give you a concrete example, we have developed a practical manual on how to conduct beneficial ownership verification as part of the due diligence process in licensing for extractives, natural resources, and other critical sectors with a high risk of state capture. 
We have been broadening our work on illicit financial flows. This means going beyond the flow of funds to address not only the vulnerabilities in developing countries, but also the enablers and facilitators in global financial centers. We have been expanding our national risk assessments to better identify and respond to the drivers of illicit flows. This includes tax evasion, virtual assets, and the abuse of shell companies and other anonymous legal structures to steal from the public purse or hide illicit funds. And this is the topic of our conversation today. Anonymous companies that hide the identity of the people who own or control them, the beneficial owners, are among the key mechanisms that enable corruption and other financial crimes. According to a 2011 report by the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative called the Puppet Masters, anonymous legal structures were used in over 70% of cases of grand corruption analyzed for the study. We are providing technical assistance to countries that seek to improve the compliance with beneficial ownership transparency measures required under the FATF standards and by contributing to country action plans and legislative reforms aimed at improving the effectiveness of national frameworks. Last but not least, we are providing investigators in developing countries who face challenges in tracing these um, stolen assets abroad with tools and know how to identify who is be hiding behind these um, opaque company structures, including through trainings in conducting financial investigations and open source investigative techniques. So there is a lot of work that is ongoing. Later this week, um, donors will meet in Stockholm to finalize the 19th replenishment of the IDA Trust Fund. Strengthening governance and institutions is a key theme of our commitments under IDA 19. We have made a specific commitment to support the disclosure and use of beneficial information in the poorest countries, and we are very dedicated to achieve this outcome. And more broadly, we have made a commitment to develop a new World Bank Group action plan to help countries confront corruption and its negative impact on development outcomes. We know, again, we're not naive, we know that alone we cannot achieve these goals, so we have been collaborating even more co closely with international partners, in particular with our sister institution, the IMF. And uh, the IMF, will hear more, I'm sure, has launched a paradigm shift in assessing the fiscal health of countries by including macro-critical components like corruption risks in their Article 4 surveillance. We're working with our partners to develop new assessments and diagnostics to help countries achieve, set achievable targets and track their progress in meeting them. I congratulate the countries, including among others, Ukraine, Slovakia, Armenia, which have signed a commitment to a new global norm on beneficial ownership transparency, an initiative which is spearheaded by the United Kingdom with the support of Open Gov Ownership and the Open Government Partnership. This leadership group of countries is paving the way for many more governments to rise to the challenge. So I'm hopeful, I'm a by, by nature optimistic person, but I'm hopeful that as putting in these metrics and putting um, naming and shaming, but also putting in measurable targets, that we will be address this issue of um, uh, shell companies and legal and privacy protections of many developing countries that are um, contributing to the problem. So. A note of caution, though, uh, and pragmatism, information on the beneficial owners of companies is by its nature highly sensitive. In any system, the corrupt go to great heights to hide their true identity and conceal their looting of public resources. So beneficial ownership frameworks achieve their purpose of transparency and accountability only in as much as they can guarantee the accuracy and reliability of the information. And this is why the question over the effectiveness of new uniforms on beneficial ownership in achieving access to accurate information cannot be an afterthought. It needs to be at the center of our debate and agenda given this um, import importance of these reforms. We've asked today's speakers to help us think about these issues and draw attention to the link between shell companies, corruption, and illicit financial flows, and to share with us new ways in which greater transparency is being achieved and new solutions are being found to the global challenge of ending the shell game. 
Tom Thousand, the Executive Director of Open Ownership, as moderator, will be leading us through an engaging and inspiring conversation, I suspect. And open ownership has been a driving force in helping countries implement beneficial ownership transparency. Prior to joining open ownership, he was head of data policy for the UK government. So I'd like to turn the program over to Thumb, and I thank you all for being here on this very important agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Chayla, for your opening remarks. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome uh, to all of you uh, here in the room in Washington and to everybody uh, watching online around the world. Um, as has been said, my name is Tom Townsend. Um, I'm the executive director of Open Ownership. Uh, we're an organization that supports governments around the world on the technical implementation of open registers of beneficial ownership. And we help them ensure that the data they collect and publish is high quality. Um, and we also carry out significant amounts of research on some of the kind of key issues that, that can present themselves as blockers to delivering these reforms. And they can be particularly around data privacy and issues around verification. So today, of course, is International Anti-Corruption Day. And I think that for all of us in the room and watching online, uh, we can be in no doubt that the abuse of anonymous companies sits at the very heart of some of the most egregious acts of corruption that we find in the world today. And with that, it's my great pleasure to have such a fantastic group of speakers this morning uh, to discuss this issue, and I'll introduce them very, very shortly. Um, firstly, though, I just wanted to say a massive thank you uh, to the World Bank team and everyone here that's worked so hard to make this event possible. We're incredibly grateful for all of your efforts. Um, as Chayla mentioned, it, it is great today that we're able to announce um, a new leadership group uh, on beneficial ownership transparency, uh, consisting of the governments of Armenia, Latvia, Mexico, Norway, Slovakia, and Ukraine, who are all committing today to be part of this group and work together to deliver open registers of company ownership in their jurisdictions. And also, I think, critically, create a new highly visible consensus that this should be the new norm. I want to thank the UK government and also the Open Government Partnership um, who have really driven the creation of this group. Um, because of this uh, week's election uh, in the UK and the rules around pre-election communication, we're not able to have the UK government join us this morning. Um, but I do want to say a special thanks to all of the UK officials and the UK's anti-corruption champion, John Penrose, for investing their time and energy in making this group happen and come together. We're here today to explore the scale of the problem that the abuse of anonymous shell companies poses and discuss how open data on true company ownership can be harnessed by government, business and critically civil society to begin to tackle corrupt practices which harm us all and particularly uh, harm some of the world's poorest economies. So without further ado, let me introduce our panel for this morning. First, it's my great pleasure to introduce Rhoda Weeks-Brown. She is General Counsel and Director of the Legal Department at the IMF. Over her career at the IMF, she has led the Legal Department's work on a wide range of significant policy and country matters and written articles and many IMF board papers on all aspects of the law and the IMF. Rhoda holds a JD from Harvard Law School, school and a BA in Economics from Howard University. She's a member of the Bar in New York, Massachusetts, and here in the District of Columbia, and she's also a member of the Supreme Court Bar. Secondly, let me introduce David Zaconi. David is Assistant Professor of Political Science at George Washington University. He's also an Academy Scholar at Harvard and a Research Fellow at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. His research interests include political economy, authoritarian regimes, corruption, and non-market strategy. And one of his current projects underway in Russia and the United States um, is looking at uh, business people running for and winning elected office. Uh, his forthcoming book, Politics for Profit, Business and Elections, will look at that issue. Next up, it's my great pleasure to welcome Andre Leontiev. Andre is a partner and co-heads the second biggest international law firm in Slovakia, Taylor Wessing. Andre worked on multiple legislative initiatives for different Slovak ministries and was one of the main leaders on the transparency of beneficial ownership in Slovakia. Andre is also the co-author of the Slovak Anti-Shell Companies Law. Last but no means least, it's my great pleasure to introduce Alex Cobham. Alex is Chief Executive of the Tax Justice Network and Commissioner for the Statutory Poverty and Inequality Commission for Scotland. He is also a founding member of the Steering Group of the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation and on the Technical Advisory Group for the Fair Tax Mark. 
His work focuses on, on illicit financial flows, effective taxation for development, and inequality. His new book, The Uncounted, has just been published, and he's working on a second book called Estimating Illicit Financial Flows, A Critical Guide to Data, Methodologies, and Findings, which is co-written with Peter Jansky. That will be published next year. A very, very warm welcome to all of you. I'm so grateful for you taking the time to be here, and in some cases, traveling so far to do so. Very briefly, here's how we're going to run things this morning. I've asked each of the panelists uh, for their perspective for in around eight minutes or so, and then we'll really open it up for discussion from questions from the floor and also uh, from those of you online. As uh, Elizabeth mentioned right at the start, the hashtag for today's event is United Against Corruption. Um, and of course, this is being live streamed. So for those of you watching online, um, if you use that hashtag and ask your questions, uh, we'll try and get through as many of them as possible. So. Without further ado, I'd first like to invite Alex uh, to join us at the podium, if he wishes to, to tell us about his work and his perspective. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, and thank you to the World Bank for the uh, opportunity to, to speak to you on uh, International Anti-Corruption Day. Um, this is one day of the year, but of course every day is an uncounted day. Please buy the book, all proceeds to the Tax Justice Network. The uh, issue of what is uncounted um, underpins all of the work on both corruption and inequality that organisations like the Tax Justice Network and indeed the World Bank um, require to focus on. Um, and I want to talk through from some general points to some more specific ones about the way in which these things are entwined and the way the problem of corruption is a problem of what is uh, uncounted. Um, I'm contractually obliged to say something about the Tax Justice Network. We were set up in 2003 um, as a, an independent network of experts, economists, lawyers, accountants and others, um, working on different issues, bringing social justice into otherwise technical conversations. And as uh, Professor Piketty has been kind enough to say, we've really managed to bring these issues from often really the margins of policy discussions into the centre uh, of the agenda. Now, the big shift that's happened over the last 15 to 20 years can be seen in a couple of maps. And the question the maps consider is, where is corruption? The old view, if I can call it that, is that corruption is largely a problem of lower income countries. Now, some people have called the Corruption Perceptions Index structurally racist. Certainly, it appears to reflect a colonial history. And you'll see the darkest red areas are very much in lower income countries. And indeed, in any given year, 60 to 80% of the index can be explained simply by a correlation with per capita incomes. Corruption is perceived as poverty and vice versa. If we look, though, at measures based on objectively verifiable criteria about where the financial secrecy that drives corruption is, the narrative flips. The overwhelming majority of the financial secrecy that's embedded in the globalization we have today comes from high income countries, OECD member countries, and their dependencies, in particular the, the UK's um, network of crown dependencies and overseas territories. The United States, you'll see there, is ranked number two in the index, although uh, the new index is out in January, and we'll see what happens. Um, then, certainly no stranger, uh, neither the country nor this administration, to beneficial ownership opacity. The Financial Secrecy Index is based on a policy platform that the Tax Justice Network put together in 2003-45, when we were first set up, what we call the ABC of tax transparency. That's the automatic exchange of tax information between countries. If you hold assets and income streams in one country, is your home country tax authority notified or not? Is there an opacity there or not? Secondly, what we're talking about today, beneficial ownership transparency, not just for companies, but importantly also for trusts and foundations. Any legal vehicle that allows you to take control of assets and income streams ought to bring with it a requirement for the ownership, the ultimate beneficial ownership, to be publicly registered. Otherwise, if we only deal with a certain sort of legal vehicles, and this is a problem in the UK where there are multiple legal vehicles, some of them transparent, some of them opaque, we simply squeeze the dirty business into the opaque vehicles. And finally, country by country reporting, public uh, data from multinational companies 
that exposes the difference, if there is one, between where their economic activity takes place and where their profits are being declared and their taxes being paid. Each of the key forms of illicit financial flows that rely on opacity to go uncounted and, as a result, generate the kind of scale of um, problem that we see. Something like $500 billion in lost revenues every year to multinational profit shifting. Perhaps $200 billion a year to undeclared assets held offshore. Now, as I said, we've brought that from the margins to the global agenda with a, a lot of other organizations working too, including uh, open ownership. Um, but it hasn't yet passed through. In particular, the benefits are largely captured by high-income countries as we're speaking today. This is just quickly shown here. The, the top line here is the Global Forum. This is the OECD body that reviews countries in terms of their transparency. You'll see there are more than 150 members, many of them developing countries. That's the orange, blue, and uh, red bars at the top. Um, but if we then look at the second and third groups here, these are the information exchange arrangements for country-by-country country reporting and for automatic exchange of tax information. And here we see most lower-income countries are actually excluded. We've won the argument about transparency, but the benefits are largely accruing only to higher-income countries. The beneficial ownership question, not addressed here, still lacks an international standard that would require everyone to report on this, and that's something we hope to see the leading group really take a lead on, not just delivering nationally, but raising the standard globally of what is expected. Thinking about an organisation like the World Bank, you, know, you can see there are still challenges in terms of the things that go uncounted, whether that's, for example, the Doing Business Index, which you know, ferments this race to the bottom in regulation instead of promoting the value of transparency uh, as it could do through beneficial ownership arrangements, for example. Or it's questions like the IFC's role in continuing to promote investment through some of the most secretive jurisdictions in the world into lower income countries. There is a whole set of uh, issues in this agenda to um, act on. The upshot of this is that we have a problem of the uncounted. People at the bottom of income and wealth distributions, especially women, people from indigenous uh, groups, other uh, marginalized ethno-linguistic groups, people with disabilities, including especially learning disabilities, who for all sorts of reasons are not just more likely to be at the bottom of those distributions, but also more likely to be uncounted in the kind of census data and household survey data that we use to address inequality. At the same time, the uncounted money of the high income groups and about 10% of household wealth uh, around the world is held offshore and the high income household groups are many times more likely to be tax evading than our lower income groups. We still don't have hard numbers on all of this, but we know those are hard facts. What this gives us is a level of inequality that is much higher than what we see, much higher than what we think we are accepting politically and therefore we are allowing inequality along with un, uh, uh, corruption to go uncounted. There's an uncounted manifesto of which I will talk only about one point, which is the most relevant one here, but a set of global architecture measures that will help us to deal with this. On beneficial ownership, what we lack uh, and you know, are now starting to see people working on, including uh, ICRICT, the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation, is a global asset registry, as proposed by Gabriel Zuckman and Thomas Piketty. Now, this would join up not just for companies, trusts, and foundations, but also for major other sources of financial wealth and non-financial wealth, open registers at the national level um, into a single registry in order, finally, to cut through the issue of the uncounted as it affects high-level wealth and as it promotes corruption uh, around the world. There is a lot of counting that we can do. We have the technological means to do it, and the question, perhaps, for us today really is whether we have the political will. Thank you. Um, David, I'm going to pass over to you uh, now to talk about your work on analysing some of this data at scale and what that can reveal to us about the scale of the challenge and what we can do about it. So, over to you. Thank you, Tom. To the Open Ownership 
and to the World Bank for hosting such an interesting um, event for this morning. Today, I'm going to be talking a bit about a new initiative put together by a team of people working on corruption and anti-corruption around the world. I'm not going to be debuting necessarily any new findings, but talking more about methodology and challenges of applying beneficial ownership registries, if they do or do not exist, and other databases in order to shine the light on corruption, especially in advanced economies. So this kind of nation initiative we're calling the Anti-Corruption Data Collective, ACDC, if you may you might remember it after today's talk. We think of ourselves as a team of, of data scientists, academics, journalists, and civil society advocates, all trying to combat corruption in advanced or developed economies, where we think much less attention, as Alec has already kind of briefly mentioned, has been paid. So here, the, the focus is less on pursuing stories of corruption as they make leak into the public domain through whistleblowers or leaks, but trying to bring together disparate groups of talented individuals and organizations to combine their talents and tackle problems, and I'll talk about two of the problems we've highlighted and are going to focus on, through combining data, machine learning, and different other, or other technological tool sets in order to scale up the use of open data around the world. And one of the operating problems that we're trying to, to kind of build or, or build from is the idea that just opening up a lot of these registries to the public does not necessarily solve the problem. And that you require capacity and ability among people to actually know how to use the data, to parse it, and to apply it in their investigations. And we've seen this gap between getting all the data out there on the internet and actually using it and deriving knowledge and new insights. And what we think of this initiative as exactly that middle stage, the hard data wrangling, potentially very boring type of coding and, and computer skills that are required to bridge the, the data that we're putting on the internet and the actual insights that we want to gain. So the two problems that I'm going to be talking about are the real estate, and I haven't Just your left. clicked. That would be helpful. There's, the, there's our logo for now. If you have any suggestions, I'd appreciate it. Um, <laughs> are going to be real estate and investment funds. And again, our, our goal is investigative stories, large-scale data analysis with, you know, hopefully academic articles for the academics that are involved in the team, like myself, and lobbying and advocacy campaigns in order to put, to get, put forth new policy solutions to tackle the problems. So how are we doing this? Well, in the kind of conventional investigative framework, you start from the left and move right. So for example, the, the you know, famous Panama and Paradise le leaks were kind of, um, they benefited by whistleblowers, very noble, honest individuals, opening up the archives of their organizations and allowing journalists to peek in and show how the money flowed from politically exposed people through shell companies, through other companies in the West, and forward into developed economies. What we'd like to do is start from the right, which is money in the West, whether it be infrastructure projects, political ad spend, campaign contributions, lobbying, subsidies, and tax breaks, of which there's innumerable public, publicly available data by governments. Connect them to the companies that are actually making these type of spending or investments. Then back to the companies that own them, and then back toward the beneficial ownership. And that's how it links in with this talk, which is gathering and linking massive data sets, some of which are proprietary, some of which are open source, but some of which are leaked, but doing this at scale. So instead of looking for individuals who we suspect are involved in nefarious activities, using different al algorithmic approaches in order to red flag and hone in on hundreds or thousands of potentially suspicious cases of money flowing from politically exposed people or corrupt or money launders back into advanced economies and how it how it affects um, the average lives of citizens in the West. Now, doing that is actually quite difficult. And I think we all wouldn't be here today if the problem was actually solved. And through the last year and a half of trying to bring together these data sets and squeeze out as much as possible from them, we've run up into four main challenges. Now, there's a lot of political will behind getting beneficial ownership registries out there, but the technical implementation has lagged, and a lot of politicians have pointed to these technical difficulties and used them to stall the process. 
And we think that there's a lot of room for coordination and cooperation, especially through international leadership, to help solve some of these problems at the international level, to make it easier for countries to get on board, open up their registries, and make them usable for researchers or civil society organizations very, very immediately. So the first one, it's hard to access the data that we need to finish the, ex uh, to finish the investigations. A lot of it is disparately organized across the internet. Even if it is available, it takes weeks, if not months, to get it in a usable form. So getting bulk, publicly available, kind of machine-readable data is one of the first critical steps and from a technical implementation point of view. Second, as we all know, individuals maybe not myself, because I have a very unique last name, but we share a lot of attributes with one another. And even first, last, and middle names and birth dates is not enough to uniquely identify ourselves. And we know that companies often choose very recognizable names in order to brand themselves, but that makes it very, very hard to distinguish one from another. So one big push that we'd like to see in the technical implementation of beneficial ownership going registries going forward is unique identifiers both at the individual and the company level so that we can be more confident when we combine data sets with one another that we're getting the right individuals and organizations and making this a priority from the get-go. The third is different thresholds in reporting. And I want to commend Tom and Open Ownership for taking the lead on this with open standards to make sure that everybody is on the same page about what should be included in a registry, how that should be formatted, and how it should be made available. Because a lot of times, these problems are uniquely cross-border, and you need to have simultaneous access to many countries' different registries in order to make strong and persuasive claims. And finally, there's these intentionally convoluted corporate structures that I think many in the room are aware of, where there's these long legal chains of ownership through corporate subsidiaries and, and structures that lead to one or two beneficial owners that we're actually the most interested in. Beneficial ownerships are an important step for unlocking this chain, but we need to know all the different legal owners between the type of activity or investment um, that we're interested in and the ownership that could make it more complicated to actually figure out who owns what. And finally, I'm going to include with kind of the elephant in the room is, can we trust any of the data in beneficial ownership registries? And again, I'm an optimist, and I think you can. But more investment needs to be made in val val or verification and validation. And I think this is actually much easier than a lot of people have presupposed. Partly because data science is advancing so rapidly, especially in the private sector, and has solved many of the same issues that are plaguing the implementation of actually making sure that the people on paper in these registries are behind the companies. So for one, as we develop this initiative, we've been surprised by the amount of kind of socially aware and involved tech talent that have expressed the fatigue with the private sector and are looking for more civically oriented projects to get involved with genius minds that have helped made for, make fortunes on Silicon Valley looking to apply their talents in the public sector. The question for us is how do we get them involved? How do we engage them to transfer some of their know-how into automating the cross-checking, matching, and verification of the databases at the country level, and then implementing nearly automatic punishments and fines for people found in violation of the laws and regulations requiring ownership standards? Because I see potential for a self-sustaining revenue stream where these beneficial ownership registries may have some high fixed costs at the beginning as you invest in technology. But when people are found in violation, the money they're paying as punishments could help fund the tech talent needed to build them out. And that there would be transplantable tools that would be available for any jurisdiction so they could use the same type of algorithms and big data approaches no matter where they are located around the world to make sure that the data is matching up and we're more confident in the owners that we're actually getting from people that are submitting their forms. So again, I'm quite optimistic about this, but I don't think the challenge is that unique, especially compared to what credit card companies or the tech companies have already been able to achieve combining data sets. This is actually quite minor in comparison. So I'll leave it there. I'm sorry to bore you with such technical problems that we've been dealing with, but I think this is quite a, what we need to bridge the gap between a lot of great words about where we want to take this issue and what it's actually going to take to get there. And I actually think the problems maybe are not simple, but are accessible than I think a lot of people are. We shouldn't be as scared off of them as we could be just looking at them from the bird's eye view. So thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, David. And I'm looking forward to any questions. And I'll leave this.
Um, thank you very much, David. And um, it, it's great to hear someone talk so positively about how verification is achievable. In so many of these four across the world, people kind of throw their hands up in the air and say it's probably not possible to do. So it's really good to hear you describing how we can achieve that. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to invite uh, Andre uh, to speak to us. Um, Andre uh, is with Taylor Wessing in Slovakia, and um, I think it's no understatement to say that was he was pivotal uh, in passing some incredible reforms in Slovakia that have led to some really big impacts. So, Andre, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, event. I think I'm the only one from the panelists who, am, who is uh, from a private sector. Um, it is maybe important to say that I think one of the most important uh, issues is how we involve uh, private sector in uh, discussions about this um, basically public uh, legal topic, corruption, uh, shell companies. Um, I will start with a short story. Um, uh, you all know that the shell companies are used to different, um, uh, different purposes. Um, we in Central and Eastern Europe uh, see that the shell companies are used more for um, um, hiding or covering conflict of interests between politicians and businesses, less for tax optimization schemes, which is more the problem of West, Western European countries, because Central Europe has low taxes uh, at this moment, which will probably change, and this will be also our problem. So how the Slovak anti-shell companies uh, law um, was motivated, it was uh, by um, a public um, understanding of how uh, bad is the conflict of interest between politicians and businesses who receive public uh, um, contracts uh, from the state. There was a construction company in Slovakia receiving uh, um, hundreds of million euros uh, from EU funds for constructing highways in Slovakia. This company was uh, uh, purchased by uh, uh, an individual who is a political sponsor of the governing uh, party in Slovakia. Uh, the problem was not only that this company was very successful in winning tenders, uh, but uh, no one knew who is behind this company and why this company is so successful uh, during the last uh, 10 years. But the problem was when this company went bankrupt, uh, uh, we basically realized that uh, thousands of uh, workers uh, stayed without pay, uh, uh, hundreds of companies who were subcontractors to this construction company stayed without uh, get, get pay. And uh, the, the owners uh, were hiding and saying this is not their problem. It was a shell company structure behind which went even direction to New Zealand and nominee uh, directors. Uh, we realized that you need a public uh, 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 public pressure uh, on the politicians to do something, and we used this and uh, offered a legislative uh, uh, model how uh, you could, uh, on a national level, uh, tackle uh, anonymity of uh, ownership. Uh, I will go first to the principles uh, which we discovered uh, work uh, well in Slovakia, and then maybe I will uh, speak about some uh, data and what we learned from, or maybe what we all can learn from this case. Slovakia is a small country, 5.5 million inhabitants. You can do any reform very fast and, so this, and see the results even uh, within uh, one election period. So the law we proposed was uh, passed uh, 2017, so it's two and a half year uh, old, and um, basically the the principle is that uh, Slovakia is a member of the European Union, so we have to be harmonized with the European law. So we cannot invent something which goes against uh, European law. Uh, so we realize that um, going after the anon anonymized uh, uh, structures, we have to find a platform which is above European law, which is anti-money laundering principles. We are very grateful for this international concept which goes beyond European law, because as you may know, Europe uh, has uh, passed two directives, the fourth and the fifth anti-money laundering directive, which uh, openly speaking are completely formalistically implemented in all EU countries. 
So if you look in the uh, company registries looking for a beneficial owner of a company, uh, those uh, who have no problem, you will find them, but the 5%, those who are cheaters, will be uh, not disclosed uh, even after the fourth and fifth anti-money laundering directive. So we realized we need in Slovakia a parallel regime, a parallel uh, registry. We call it the register of partners of public sector. It means any company, domestic or foreign, dealing with Slovak public finance, so either acquiring assets or selling assets or receiving uh, subsidies, funds, EU funds via Slovakia, must register its beneficial owners in a publicly accessible online registry. Uh, and uh, only after this uh, disclosure of the beneficial ownership, it can uh, receive the money. Um, the reason uh, why we are pushing this is that the state has to show that he has uh, interests in fighting money laundering, because before the state is doing it on, on, on his side, it's very difficult to require this from businesses to do. So Slovakia is now looking closely with whom is Slovakia doing business. So it's a, uh, it's a register who is, uh, which is online, for free, and uh, the data which are provided into this, re is this register are verified by professionals. Coming to those things which uh, David and uh, Alex already mentioned, uh, we cannot fight uh, shell companies without involving lawyers, tax advisors, banks. These are, these are the industries who are basically living from, from uh, this uh, uh, situation. So in Slovakia, we said each company which will be registered in the registry has to go through a private verification of a lawyer, bank, accountant, uh, someone who has a liability, uh, insurance, a reputation to lose, who knows the standards how to do it. So the Slovak law is based on the principle that only professionals can register a company into this registry. And the register, what is the condition to be registered? Uh, if you do business with state and you pass a de minimis amount, uh, which is a value of the contract, so we didn't want to go after those who are doing business with state and, and doing just a couple of euros. So in Slovakia, the value of the contract must be more than 250,000, basically. And, uh, there was, there was also an idea uh, how to involve a, a court or someone who will look after the accuracy of the data. Because I think we have a very high standard of accuracy because uh, private entities are doing the verification, but you still need an entity looking after this. So we decided it will be a court. Uh, uh, in Slovakia, the court is also running the commercial registry. So the court is overseeing the special registry. And, and this is important, if there is from a public any action uh, that uh, someone considers the data in the registry uh, not uh, true or inaccurate, they can turn to the court and the court will review this uh, registration. But the burden of proof that the data are accurate are shifted in this moment to the company. So we basically try to keep the company administratively not burdened too much if they are doing the registration, but if there is a, a doubt on the accuracy, the company has to prove that the data in the registry are, is true. This is, I think, the, the main uh, specific of the Slovak law. First, the verification through professionals, and the second, of shift of burden of proof to the company if there is a, a reasonable doubt about the accuracy uh, of the data. Uh, speaking about uh, the achievements, uh, in Slovakia we have more than 20,000 persons registered in this registry and only 30 Cypriotic national, uh, natural persons are in the registry, which means if we have uh, more than 1,000 uh, Cyp Cyprus, Cyprus companies in the holding structures, we succeeded to see through them to the beneficial owner in a way that only these 30 natural persons remained. And for a court now to look individually, you can look for into 30 cases. This is not such a big quantum of data to review. 
So uh, I think we are quite uh, successful um, with the with the system. Of course, it cost, the costs of the systems are that uh, the lawyers, the banks, and the attorney, uh, the accountants or notaries, they are requiring a fee for the verification. The average costs are per company around 500 euros. Um, Finally, I think we will have time to speak during uh, the discussion about some cases which were on a European level discovered via this Slovak registry of partners of uh, public sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Andre. And um, I think we'll get into some more detail, as you mentioned, about some of the cases uh, that have been revealed through Slovakia's incredibly robust regime and reversal of burden of proof on verification. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you, Rhoda, to um, discuss the IMF's um, view on these reforms. And um, would you like to use the podium? Sure. Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks to Chela and to um, World Bank colleagues for inviting us to be part of this discussion. Huge thanks also to my fellow panelists. Those were fascinating um, discussions um, showing the range of things going on in this space. Um, Tom had thought it would be interesting for me to touch a little bit on some of the broader macroeconomic aspects of this topic that sort of in some ways drives the fund's interest in these issues and then say a little bit about what we're doing in close partnership with other um, entities, in particular the World Bank, but also with civil society um, and a range of others in this space to try to address these issues in our narrow sort of macroeconomic space. So first, just looking, uh, touching a little bit on this, as already implied by what I said, the IMF's interest and concern on these issues goes back to our mandate of um, macroeconomic and financial stability. and arises directly because of the completely devastating impact and destabilizing impact that these kinds of flows uh, can have, and that issues related to the transparency of beneficial ownership sort of can tend to exacerbate in that context. Just to start with one illustration of the scale of the problem, recent research involving IMF staff has estimated that $12 trillion, which is almost 40% of all foreign direct investments, over 12 trillion passes through empty corporate shells, um, having no real activity associated with them. Um, and this is, amount that, this is an amount that's pretty huge if you think of it as a percentage of global GDP, you're way above 10% in that respect. Of course, not all of these flows should be considered illicit, but it's pretty obvious that anonymous corporate structures and a lack of information about beneficial ownership of those structures can play a critical role in facilitating illicit um, flows. Another statistic, this was in our September Finance and Development magazine. And by the way, I encourage everyone to look at that if you haven't seen it yet, because it's focused on these issues. It's called Follow the Money, and it has a range of issues um, covering all aspects of this, from data to practical implementation issues. But that had a statistic, $7 trillion equal to 8% of global GDP is the amount of private wealth that is currently estimated to be hidden in offshore financial centers. And of course, we know that shell companies can be misused in several ways, including for criminal activities. And one area that the fund has been focusing on is the misuse in that respect, with respect to corruption in particular. Um, there can be misuse, of course, to conceal the proceeds of corruption, but also used as a vehicle to generate corrupt proceeds, which we've seen in some countries where you have these companies actually participating, for example, in public procurement processes. Uh, we've been studying the many channels and the costs of corruption um, under our new policy that Sheila mentioned. I'll say a little bit more about that earlier. But one of the biggest impacts of corruption is obviously the loss of tax revenues and the huge detrimental effect that that can have on critical resource mobilization efforts, even as so many of our member countries are trying to reach the SDGs. Um, the impact on infrastructure projects and more general and the ability to boost economic growth. We had a uh, edition of our fiscal monitor in spring of this year focused solely on curbing corruption and a pretty astounding statistic there that over a trillion dollars in tax revenues are lost annually, annually to corruption alone. And much of this, of course, at a time again when we're trying to get these resources towards the SDGs. Um, and again, I don't want to get into the details. We all know all of this, but other costs related to lower spending on things like health and education 
um, higher public expenditure, much more low quality and inefficient expenditure. Again, our research uh, providing further details on some of these kinds of issues. Lower tax compliance leading to a complete delegitimizing of the tax system. Chela referred to this earlier. If people know that the wealthy elites are using um, you know, shell companies and aren't paying the taxes, why would anyone pay taxes? And again, we do see direct links of that kind. And of course, growing inequality out everywhere, undermining of public trust in government manifested, as many believe, in the kinds of um, protests we've seen recently in the face of all of the growing inequality of both wealth and income that we're seeing everywhere. Just quickly, again, other aspects that we've been looking at with respect to the use of shell companies is the macroeconomic effects that can result when these companies, um, fueled by criminal proceeds, crowd of bona fide entrepreneurs in countries, resulting in investments that are sort of useful for the illicit purposes for which those investments are being made, but have very little in terms of actual productive uses. Another really critical thing we're seeing is an increasing use of investments that will, will result in inflationary uh, pressures in so many countries. Real estate bubbles that we've seen in many cases are a good example of that. But again, it's not limited to that. And again, these can be truly destabilizing and in a number of countries have had pretty pernicious uh, macroeconomic effects. And it's not just macroeconomics, it sort of ultimately hits individuals in those countries. A last aspect I'm going to mention is also the impact on correspondent bank relationships that we've seen um, that basically concerns illicit, associated with illicit flows in general with the use of, with the lack of transparency of beneficial ownership in particular, leading to pressures on relationships and resulting in decisions by an increasing number of correspondent banks to withdraw or restrict services to the respondent banks in those countries um, and if they believe this risk cannot be adequately managed. And again, the macroeconomic effects of that are huge, huge to negative impact on both countries and in some places even on regions um, that we've seen, including in the Caribbean and other places. So. Um, what is the fund doing about all of this? Um, like I said at the beginning, I think to be very clear, we're not purporting to be experts or to be the only one relevant in this space. We work very close, closely with the bank. We have an increasing partnership with civil society and others on these issues. Um, and I think it's fair to say that we're, we're addressing these issues in a wide range of ways in all of our core work areas. So again, for the fund, We've got surveillance, Sheila mentioned, which is our regular routine um, Article 4 consultations that we have with every member almost every year. These issues have arisen in that context. But of course, we do lending programs, also non-lending programs, where increasingly we have conditionality focus on these issues. We have a financial sector assessment program that for many years, long before the Paradise Papers and the Panama Papers, we're already looking at many of these issues, and we're continuing to do that. And also, of course, we provide a lot of technical assistant capacity development in this area. Um, and so, uh, you know, examples. I should also mention uh, our most re our recent policy on governance and anti-corruption was adopted by the IMF's executive board in April of last year. It focuses, of course, on the demand side of corruption, but it also has a significant focus on the supply side as well, with an emphasis both on Two, two notable components in that respect. The facilitation question, which is whether countries have gaps that allow the proceeds of corrupt acts to be concealed. And again, here we're looking at whether countries have effective anti-money laundering frameworks. But also we look at whether countries adequately criminalize and prosecute bribery of foreign public officials. And we've been looking at beneficial ownership issues very closely in that context. For people who've looked at our recent Article 4 reports, for example, on the US, had an extensive discussion of these issues, um, pointing to a significant number of concerns in the US system and the fundamental improvements that were needed in that respect to address these issues. Switzerland, similar discussions of um, beneficial ownership issues, Canada, Czech Republic, the UK, just to name a few. Um, I mentioned also the financial sector assessment program. Um, beneficial ownership issues were the biggest topic in our assessments between 2014 and 2018. Uh, um, we forget getting into all of the details, but again, significant coverage, for example, in the UK FSAP in 2016 and in a number of other areas. Um, we have the IMS Fiscal Transparency Code, which I think continues to be a very important part of giving advice 
in, this, in these areas. We do quite a bit of technical assistance, I, as I alluded to earlier, and um, we're right now in the process also of preparing a handbook that would drill down in more detail on these issues of transparency and beneficial ownership. Again, this would be a handbook to facilitate the capacity development that we're already giving to IMF member countries, but looking at best practices and trying to, again, drawing on what's being done by others in this area to give more concrete advice um, to our countries that, um, where we see this as being a big issue. Um, we have an, a paper coming up next year, early next year, that's going on, in, on illicit financial flows, that's going to try to take a broad, overarching look at all of these issues, pulling together our work on AML CFT, on corporate, um, uh, on the governance issues that I talked about on corruption, on international tax, which is another big area where we have quite a bit of work, working closely with the OECD, the World Bank, on the platform on corporate collaboration for tax. But this paper on illicit flows is going to pull together basically all of the work in these areas and look at, try to derive um, new solutions and new ways of addressing these issues, drawing on what's happening in the space. I also want to say a bit of a shout out, uh, picking up on David's um, focus on data issues, a bit of a shout out for an anti-corruption challenge that we launched during the spring meetings, at the, during the annual meetings a few months ago at the IMF this year. Um, we're calling on basically civil society, country author authorities and everyone to come up with solutions around a series of governance and anti-corruption topics, including how to use big data for governance in fighting corruption. So again, I encourage everyone who hasn't um, taken a look at this yet to please take a look at it. Um, it's um, closing soon, but we we'll very much welcome um, input from everyone. So like I said at the top, the macroeconomic implications, pretty hard to disagree with and pretty profound and in some countries pretty destabilizing. The work that needs to be done, huge. We're doing our little part in a pretty broad range of areas, but I can very much look forward to continued collaboration and working with everyone in this space. And I'm happy to answer questions if they're more specifics. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rhoda. Before we open this um, up to the floor, um, just a quick question uh, for the panel. Um, there are some fairly major disincentives to a number of governments around the world to, to pass these reforms. Let's be, let's be really, really clear about that. So I, I want to get people's take on, on how we overcome some of, some of those challenges inherent with the reforms that we're, we're discussing this morning. I wonder first if I could just come to Andre, though, for a, for a quick overview um, of the case of Agrofert uh, in Slovakia and the Czech Republic, because I think this is highly illustrative of why open data really matters in this space. Yes, as I mentioned, the Slovak law requires even a foreign company to register its beneficial owners in Slovakia if they are doing business with Slovak uh, government. But also it requires, of course, a Slovak subsidiary of a foreign holding to disclose beneficial owners. And if you speak about a Slovak subsidiary, uh, you, you, you have to go all the way up uh, into a foreign jurisdiction. So you have in Slovak registry many informations which are interesting also for foreign investigative uh, journalists or NGOs or um, any other watchdogs. This case was that uh, a company basically doing its fortune now in Czech Republic called Agrofert uh, was uh, founded and uh, owned by a Slovak um, entrepreneur who is now the Prime Minister of Czech Republic, uh, Mr. Andrej Babiš. Um, uh, although he is not uh, doing so much business in Slovakia now, um, he, his uh, subsidiaries uh, were registered in Slovakia in the Slovak Register of um, Public uh, Partners of Public Sector. The Czech uh, Transparency International looked into the Slovak uh, register because the data are publicly available for free, available on internet, and realized that uh, in the Slovak registry there is a document which all the entities registered uh, have to have there. It's called a verification document, which is describing not only who is the beneficial owner, but also how he is owning the holding structure. And they realized that um, although Mr. Babish um, uh, transferred the uh, shares in this holding company to a specific fund, his wife is still the one who is appointing the board of trustees. 
uh, and they went with this information to the European Commission, and the European Commission uh, was examining uh, a potential conflict of interest because uh, the government in Czech Republic is distributing the EU funds for agriculture, and a big portion of this is going to the company of Agrofert. So there is still a conflict of interest between a politician and a company on Czech market, and this uh, ended up with these mass demonstrations in Czech Republic, more than one million people, which in a country of 10 million people, went to the streets uh, f uh, and demonstrated against this conflict of interest, which was shown because of the Slovak uh, register of, uh, of um, uh, partners of public sector. Thank you very much, Andre. And it's going to be fascinating to see how that plays out and the kind of reforms that the Czech Republic looks to pass as a result of this case. Um, I'll turn to you perhaps next, Alex, to ask you, how do we overcome some of these very clear disincentives to change? It's a good point, but I think we should feel pretty optimistic on this. You know, 10 years ago, progress in this area was very far away. And, you know, when you were pushing for it, you were often... Uh, kind of called un unrealistic and, and so on. I think one thing that's changed is, um, you know, the, the, the balance. The argument is now the other way around. We, we've been through this period where the, the argument always put back to us was, this will cost money, this will have compliance costs, why would you do this? Right, and that backs up uh, an unwillingness politically. But I think there's a much more embedded sense of the argument about the quid pro quo these days, to use a term I hear is popular in these parts. You know, the uh, reason for allowing companies to have limited liability, so allowing directors to run businesses without the risk that they would lose their family home if it went, was always that you gave more transparency of the accounts and of the ownership. And that's for hundreds of years been established. We've somehow allowed that to slip away in a race to the bottom over the last few decades. But that argument is terribly compelling. And now that we've started making it again, I think it's there. The fact that you've got a lot of the UK overseas territories and crown dependencies committing following the UK to have a register, a public register in place within the next few years, or at least to legislate for it. And we'll see how that goes depending on our election. Um, but you know, it suggests that we are at the point of an international standard. The obstacle to that is this country. And I think it may well be that 2021 is the point at which an international standard can be created. Without that, there's a great emphasis on the political mobilization in this country to demand a level of transparency that's not there yet. Um, Roder, I'll come to, come to you. You mentioned conditionality uh, is an important factor in, in driving these reforms. What else from the IMS perspective do you think is going to drive this change and in, in this reform? I mean, I think the, I think the, the fact that these were having so many conversations, I think people are now beginning to be more aware of the direct sort of costs of these, what used to seem like these sort of far away kinds of things, again, partly because of the efforts of organizations such as some of these on this, this stage and countries. So I think that increased awareness in itself is going to be helpful. And with we'll going to specific countries, I think the more that it becomes clear where the outliers are, I think that that sort of global political consensus will help to move things in the right direction. Um, again, I don't know how long it takes, but again, I think it's hard in the face of the increasing sort of data and statistical information we have on the impact of these practices that we won't eventually get there. Having said that, though, I do want to be a bit cautious in terms of what that means, even if we do eventually come to some sort of a broader global consensus that we have now. Again, just in terms of some of the countries that we work with, there are significant just capacity issues around some of these kinds of things. And it takes a long time to put in place the kinds of mechanisms that you see in some parts of Europe, again, you know, Slovakia did this and it's amazing, but most of the countries we deal with is going to be huge to do that. So I just want to say, even when that, even without that consensus emerging, I think we're making good progress and we need to continue pushing and the, the countries that are willing can be part of that. But I think the capacity issues can be understated in that respect that we do need to keep, to keep an eye to make sure that we're, we're providing technical assistance that the sort of things that others on this stage are doing to help get more countries in that direction. Thank you. And, and David, I'll just turn to you. I mean, so much of your work is about illustrating this and using that for advocacy purposes. What's, what's going to shift the dial? I mean, everyone's very positive, so, so I need you to be as well. I have kind of two 
perspectives. The first is that emphasizing the amount of money that can be gained or saved because of beneficial ownerships, I think, is something we want to prioritize. So governments in terms of lost tax revenue, businesses in terms of not having to spend as much on due diligence because governments are starting to pay part of that by creating these registries, and then communicating to citizens about how opacity is a tax on economic activity and on their welfare, and that it's restricting competition, and that we're paying out of our pocketbooks because companies are being able to shield their owners. So I think that's one perspective. The other is from a, I'm going to put my political science cap on, you need to build coalitions in order to get laws through. What we've seen in the United States is that law enforcement agencies, when national security appeals are levied, can and will organize on behalf of beneficial ownership registries. And there are other types of groups and coalitions within society that have clear incentives to advocate for this type of legislation, whether that be banks because of the due diligence costs, or other types of consumer organizations, or people caring about tax fairness, that there are so many beneficiaries in many different respects, either from an economic or from a national security perspective, that it's about making the right arguments and about building coalitions. But I don't think the right, I don't think there's a positive of people that want the legislation passed. It's about getting the organizations and, and the coordination between them and finding the, the right rhetorical appeals to communicate that to lawmakers. They're all available, but it's hitting the right note, I think, is the next step. Before we turn to the floor, I'm just going to hand to you quickly. I Andre. just would like to add one more thing. What we are using also in Slovakia to advocate uh, the transparency uh, also for business people, uh, corruption is disrupting competition. So uh, all those who are uh, doing a business in a clean way, they should be interested into identifying those crooks who are not doing it the same way. So leveling the play f playing field uh, among businesses, so not even dealing with state or public finance, uh, would be also an argument why we need to have a beneficial ownership registry. Thank you. Um, right, let's turn um, to questions either from the floor or online if we have them. Um, we use this. Do we have any questions here in the room? No, we don't. It seems like we've been extraordinarily thorough. <laughs> Gentleman here. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Seattle Hansen. work at the World Bank. Thank you all for very interesting presentations. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the idea of a global registry and how that would auto-finance itself. I can see all kinds of difficult in, in, in trying to implement, design something like that and implement it uh, uh, as well. And it should probably be pursued with a bit of caution. But I wanted to hear a little bit more details on that. Thank you. Alex, over to you. Uh, it's a good question, yes. I did make it sound in briefly something like you'd, you'd create it in one go and it would be there. Ta -da. Um, no, I mean, the, the discussions are ongoing. And this, this touches on, on David's very good points about um, uh, legal entity identifiers and individual taxpayer identifiers. It's thinking about the mechanics, the piping between the different sources of transparency that we have. You know, land registries, cadastres in lots of countries, for example, registries of the ownership of financial securities. How you start to put them together with corporate registries and trusts and foundation registries. And at the same time thinking, not all of this data necessarily should be fully public open data. So you might have levels of access. And some of this would be about individual taxpayers' financial accounts, which probably isn't something that you'd have any aspect of in the public domain. But for some regulators, including tax authorities, you'd be able to make the links there too. So it's, a, I think, a process that's going to come gradually over time. At the minute, the pilot work that um, ICRIC is doing is focusing on the UK. That's taken a bit of a lead, but also where, historically, there are more different sources available. Already, you can see the opportunities, but also the obstacles, um, technical as much as, as political. So I think it's a, you know, it is a long-term work in progress. But you know, when first Zuckman, then Piketty proposed it, it had the look of that kind of idea that you know, the Tax Justice Network was thinking of 15 years ago that you said this is unrealistic, impossible. And actually, 10 years later, you're thinking, oh, we should have asked for more. You know, that's kind of, I think it's one of them. Let's come back in five years. But, you know, things are moving now, both on the technical side and politically, as this idea that transparency should be the norm rather than opacity gets uh, further embedded. I think the, the doors are opening. Gentlemen here in the front row, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, very interesting presentation. 
Uh, just one question about how do we move the agenda forward? I mean, a lot of the effort that we have been working on uh, tend to, to be at the country level. When we talk about beneficial ownership, it requires international cooperation. We just wanted to maybe hear from you whether the current structure that we have at the international level in terms of international cooperation can support uh, this type of initiative. If not, what kind of additional changes you would propose? Who would like to come and respond to that? And Alex, you're very welcome to, and sort of potentially turn to, to Rhoda as well on this topic. Uh, happy to again. Um, thank you. It's, it's a question, it comes up in each of the areas we work on where, by and large, the, the rule setting or at least norm setting power has tended to sit with the OECD, but there's a, a clear governance gap where the OECD, despite its best efforts, in some cases cannot be globally representative. And that raises questions, you know, the, the sort of um, the, the graph I had up about who is included in terms of scrutiny being very different from who is included in terms of the benefits of transparency. With the international tax rules, that's a much more live discussion about, you know, should and if so when things move to a, a United Nations forum. On beneficial ownership, I think there is some sense that the Global Forum and FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, are providing a global space in a, in a slightly more meaningful way. And so the possibility of, of them kind of retaining that role but genuinely delivering globally is perhaps greater. But I think it comes back to the, the same problem you'd have in actually in any forum, which is the, the power of this country when it wants to block, to block. Um, and you know whether you're the Cayman Islands or you're the new Nairobi International Financial Center, if the US is uh, obstructing beneficial ownership transparency, it's very easy for you to say, well, we'll follow when they follow. And that's an issue that's going to be in, in any forum, regardless of the, the democratic nature or not. Can I turn to you, sort of, where next for, for the international system? Well, I don't know if we can quite address that, but just to pick up on the point that I think the existing sort of key organizations, FATA, for example, is one that um, we hadn't talked about before, but certainly play a key role in that respect. I know there are issues around the the particular standard and whether it couldn't be more robust, especially given where we're sort of the consensus seems to be going. But I think I think there are I think there are sort of organizations in this space. There's the broader political economy kinds of considerations that have been raised. But again, I want to go back to this point that I think someone alluded to earlier, just on what I would call the communications issue, the sort of explaining to people so there's a broader shared understanding of why this matters for mm -hmm. them. And again, I really think in that sense, even the terminology we use, the sort of beneficial ownership, um, it's hard to explain. People don't quite get it. So again, I don't want to oversimplify this, but I think political systems and political structures move when there's enough sort of understanding of what is at stake. And again, we're, we're all in our own ways sort of helping to publicize and make this more systematic. But I think there's important issues around that. I think, for example, of corruption and how we did a video at the IMF for the annual meetings. And we literally just sent people with a roving mic out to you know, countries and just said, what do you think about corruption? And those people articulated the case for why corruption matters economically about as eloquently, I think, as I've heard any IMF economists articulated and without all the data and the econometrics and all that. It's hard to get people to do that when you talk about beneficial ownership. So I'm just trying to say I think we need to build this on multiple levels. I don't think it's just the institutions. It's the political support and I think we it's it's a lot of it comes down to communications and making the case. Yeah. Without oversimplifying. Thank you. Um, a question from Tom, the if I if I may just oh, add uh, I think what we saw also that the younger generation uh, is not listening so well to the topic of uh, be more anti-corrupt, you will get more foreign direct investment. Uh, the young generation would like to listen to a topic, uh, um, is it, is our, are the shell companies used for uh, some wrong environmental actions, for example, or uh, for uh, um, other negative aspects? So I think reducing the topic only to to foreign direct investment uh, is, is losing a lot of uh, uh, sympathy. I mean, FDI is pretty exciting, though. 
point is, it's not just FDI. It's the impact on everything from, you know, schools and education Absolutely. and nutrition and health and all of these kinds of things that that it translates into. Please. Yes, uh, uh, my name is Nazanin Ali, and I work on public procurement in the southern and east part of Africa. And really, when you work on country systems, you will see that many of those countries, they have the best system of, on paper, on anti-money laundry, on, on, on competition law, on beneficial ownership. Even I have it in Botswana, we have it in Namibia. Mm -hmm. But I'm always struggling. Putting more systems, does it really, I mean, is it, is it making us not winning the war, winning at least some battles? Do we have really empirical evidence that adding a new system of beneficial ownership transparency is really having an impact on, on really reducing corruption? Do we have such kind of evidence that we can take it to, our, to the countries that we work with them, to our counterparts and say, yes, those are the empirical evidence that you have it, and we can really reduce those risks in your countries. It's a wonder, David, you're, let's turn to the academic to answer that question. Sure, I think that's an excellent point. And unfortunately, I, we're still in the early stages of nailing this down, especially at a cross-national perspective, probably because it's a chicken and egg problem. You need the registries in order to analyze them, but in order to get the registries, you want to demonstrate that they're going to have a positive impact. So we're kind of in this gray zone where we have some pretty good country level studies, a lot of anecdotal evidence about how the registries have been used for good when they're properly implemented and the data is of high quality. But in terms of showing from a you know, causally identified perspective that introducing a registry to such and such jurisdiction reduced, say, corruption in public procurement by 7%, I'm not aware of any of those papers yet. And it's, I think it give us two or three years where we have enough time after some of the best beneficial ownership registries have been put in place and I, in, I hesitate to say medium to high corrupt countries. So Denmark has a very fantastic beneficial ownership registry, but I doubt the impact of that is going to be substantial. We probably aren't, shouldn't take that as our end all case. But in other countries, such as Slovakia, is a prime example of there were lots of corruption in many different parts, but it's not necessarily the most corrupt or the least corrupt country in the world. And we can see that the marginal impact of the registry is going to be substantial. And I think this is one of the most fruitful opportunities for researchers trying to get involved in the space, um, not just macro level studies saying how does it correlate with indices or perceptions of corruption, but digging deep with the micro level data and showing the causal impact. Um, we should accelerate full speed ahead, and um, I'd, I'd love to talk to people that are willing to do this kind of work. Um, Alex, to you, if you can be brief, and then we'll get one more question from the floor. Sure. I, mean, it just, it, I think the, the point David makes about the research being difficult because we haven't got the measures in place is a good one, but I think there's another issue which perhaps goes more to, to what you were thinking. I think often we have said there is an issue in high-income countries. Here's the answer. Let's make everyone do it. And if you think about you know, the, the graph I put up on the common reporting standard, the reason so many developing countries are excluded from that is because of a completely unnecessary requirement for reciprocity. You know, with no data, I will put my hand on my heart and say that I don't think Switzerland is losing money because their citizens have money in Malawi and bank accounts. And for that to be a reason why Malawi doesn't receive data from Switzerland is grotesque. And you know, we shouldn't be pushing Malawi to put uh, time and effort into having that data available when we could be saying, here's the, money, the, the information that will get you much more revenues because of the Swiss holdings. Let's you know, prioritize carefully, not just go across the board. Um, let's take these final two questions. Uh, if you both want to come forward, please. Good morning. Um, my name is Emil van der Dus. I'm with the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative. Uh, we've been working on beneficial ownership for a, for a long time, and it's great. Uh, I think until 2013, this was really the exclusive domain for, for a few fat of nerds. Uh, and, and it's wonderful that there's now uh, such, a, sh such a wide forum to talk about it. I want to pick up on a point that, uh, that Rhoda made, and actually that you just addressed here, uh, Alex, which is uh, capacity constraints. Uh, in countries. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to say new uni universal norm, but we all know that the pain points are in only a, a, a limited number of jurisdictions. 
And I was wondering, you know, FATF is all about risk-based and uh, being, uh, looking where, where the pain points are highest to address the issue. I wonder whether there's any type of strategy that you have in mind for really addressing these, the pain points that we're all aware of. Mm. Uh, that would be my question. Thank you. Thank to, you. To really all of the panel. Thank you. And our final question from this gentleman. Thank so you. thank you, everyone. Fascinating panel. And I think that you cover a lot of the strategic discussion, both at the global level, national level as well. A tactical question to some of you. Maybe if you had pay attention to state-owned enterprises, and especially those who do have individual beneficiary ownership, some of them are public companies as well, whether this is the maybe in some countries the uh, space to start. Because then there is some control on the government to actually implement some of these transparency uh, measures as well. So I don't know if this was a, the topic of some of your work already. Thanks. Um, we're a little pushed for time. So um, who would like to answer the question on this sort of strategy for addressing pain points? And then maybe I can turn to, to Rhoda to, to sort of round us off, if that's OK, on state-owned enterprises potentially. Or well, Alex, do you want to give? So uh, pain points is what the Tax Justice Network does. Um, no, it's, it's a great question. The, the Financial Secrecy Index is deliberately weighted by the importance in global financial flows in order to account for that. So we don't just say, look, Vanuatu scores very badly, even though no money goes through it, so they're the bad guys. That clearly doesn't make sense. I think having some kind of weighting of that sort is important. We, we need to be aware of the risk, though, that if you... Uh, if you squeeze all of these guys, the next guy down is going to be groomed to set up an international financial centre or whatever it may be called. So it has to eventually be universal. But I think insisting that we start in places with lowest capacity makes no sense if they're also lowest risk. Um, so that, that risk weighting in terms of where the money goes is yeah, key. Um, Rhoda, can I turn to you on either of those questions, perhaps, to, to, to finish this off? I think um, on the, on the state-owned enterprises, I think we, I mean, with respect to beneficial ownership being a possible start, maybe it's not something we've looked at in, in great detail. I think the Slovakia approach of sort of focusing on companies dealing with the state is also an interesting twist, so maybe we need to, to add that to the list, but it's not, we look at state-owned enterprises more generally, especially in the, in the more general corruption area, but I must say not from this BO angle yet. But I think on the broader issue of pain points and how to address them, I think just by continuing to amplify a lot of the things we've been talking about, first calling attention to the real costs, and again, I go back to the language issue, beneficial ownership sounds very vague, there's real costs, there's real impacts, there's massive loss of resources from some of the poorest countries in the universe as a, as a result of these structures, so I think just increasing awareness of that. I think for institutions like mine, continuing to do what we do in terms of calling attention to it, IMF Article 4 may sound a bit, you know, um, esoteric, but people read these things, you know, a lot of publicity comes around them. So I think the more we can call attention to countries, including big ones that have notable deficiencies in these kinds of areas, the better. Continue working with FATF and the other, you know, OECD World Bank, others active in this space to call more attention to the standards, even if they're not where everyone, you know, other colleagues want them to be, but there are standards. How do we keep calling attention to that? And of course, providing lots of capacity development, policy advice, raising awareness among the membership. I think it, it has to be a, a process along those lines. I don't think there's any magic answers, mm. but I think continuing to call attention and to, to amplify the cause and give advice is the most we can do at this point. Um, thank you. Andre, you're poised. I'll leave it to you. I just, from the Slovak perspective, uh, we started with uh, uh, the, the, the state funds or, and public funds because, uh, you know, there is always a, a strong um, a pushing against um, a personal or, or a, there is a personal data privacy issue always. So uh, involving uh, those who are dealing with state, uh, there is another public interest to re require them to, to disclose. So we went uh, for this solution because it uh, was more acceptable uh, in the public or among the entrepreneurs. And the second thing I would like to say about Slovakia, what we did, and this is maybe also answer to what, what Africa is looking at, um, you need a legislation, you need a strong inst institutional framework, uh, you need resources, and you need implementation. So all these four uh, stages were done in Slovakia properly, because if you do only two of them and not the, the rest, it would never work. 
Thank you. Um, it's been a great pleasure to have you all here this morning. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And thank you to all of you here in the room and watching online. Um, thank you and have a good afternoon.